Welcome everyone. It's 7 p.m. on the seventh day of the seventh month of the year, which is very auspicious. I feel like I'm actually in a Lucinda Riley novel already. I'm Jeremy Trevathan. I'm the publisher at Pam Macmillan in the UK. Uh, and I'm here this evening with my very good friend and mega best-selling author, Lucinda Riley. I should warn you all that Lucinda and I are such good friends that for the rest of this conversation, she will be Lulu and I will be Jez for the purposes of this conversation, okay? Lucinda is currently writing the Seven Sisters uh, series, as you know, which is, tells the story of uh, adopted sisters and is inspired by the mythology of the famous uh, star cluster in the skies. The most recent title, The Sun Sister, set partly in Africa, is out in mass market at the end of this month. Her books have been translated into over 35 languages and have sold over uh, 25 million copies worldwide. That is the definition of a mega best-selling author. The Seven Sisters has become a global phenomenon with each book in the series being a number one bestseller across the world, including, of course, South Africa, where I think it's fair to say, Lulu, that you, are, you have some of your most engaged and joyful readers and booksellers, which is why which is the very reason why we're doing this event. Yes, well, I just love it that I get a chance to uh, say in person, uh, well, in Zoom person anyway, you know, hello, South Africa. Um, hello, all booksellers and readers in South Africa. And just thank you so much for taking the Seven Sisters to your hearts. Uh, and I just can't wait to come over and actually visit. Ooh, picture. <laughs> um, it, it's really interesting because I have traveled the globe and I have never ever been to South Africa. Uh, so it's one of those places that's always been on my bucket list. So uh, for very selfish reasons, I hope the, the world does get back to some form of normality so that I can come and actually, you know, meet some of my readers in person and obviously um, drink some of that fantastic South African wine as well. Um, yeah. Brilliant. So Lulu, our colleagues in uh, Pan Macmillan, South Africa, uh, did a shout out to your fans in South Africa and got overwhelmed with loads of uh, interesting questions for you. So I'm going to fire okay. away with some of these. First of all, um, <clears throat> there were some, so there were some really frequently asked questions, which I'm going to, far away first which is the first one is um when will the next book in the series be published well mr publisher yeah would you like to that? <laughs> so uh well depending on delivery uh, of the script which is uh, a constant refrain between author and publisher uh we plan to publish next spring so um fingers crossed everyone that we that we reach those dates there may be <laughs> there may be a bit of a a rush at the end but it's always the way um but it should be really exciting can i just interview you i think that will be far more interesting <laughs> um anyway yes i i mean i am I, I mean i'm taking time out now i am in writing the writing zone and i'm actually spending most of my day as i always do um when i'm writing that first draft in dressed in very silly clothes so i mean this is you know this is like smart um and uh yeah i have this old writing cardigan that's got more holes than it's got actual wool attached to it and uh i have a very silly hat as well because i like to because i dictate i don't actually um write on a on a computer um so i like to go outside so if the sun's shining i've got one of those silly bucket hats um uh, anyway i look a complete state i really do and i live uh in ireland in the middle of nowhere with neighbors um well cows for neighbors really I was say, and, the cows. <laughs> yeah so um i yes that's where i am at the moment and i really hope to actually get the book to you around about uh, end of October, beginning of November. Uh, but nothing can be any worse than the Sun Sister deadline, can it? That was the yeah. most. That was the most panicky uh, one. Yeah. These books. Can I just 
say to the reader is that these books are absolutely huge, as you know, um, and they weigh a ton. And I'm writing a book a year and a lot of research, massive amounts of research has to go into the stories before I can even begin. Uh, so I am literally, you know, I do work literally 24 seven to get the books ready and um so please forgive me <laughs> if if i you know um, if i'm ever publishing a little later it's it's because i am desperately trying and, and as you know jez yeah. many people with a book of this kind of size with this amount of detailed research are taking three years and i'm only taking a year yeah it's true so it's true. Um, yeah um the next question which is another one of the questions asked by a lot of fans in South Africa is what's the latest news on the TV adaptation? Mm. <laughs> mm. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's getting closer and closer to, um, you know, actually happening because everybody knows that um, when you start down the process of uh, having a book options, um, it's, it can take years. Uh, but we are literally almost there now. And I'm, I'm really excited because it really is getting to that stage that, you know, it really might happen. Um, and I think that possibly I am at the moment considering writing the screenplay because I'm an ex-actress. And um, so at least collaborating with someone on it because this is my sort of magnum opus and nobody knows this book better or the books better than I do. Um, but yes, we're, we're sort of at that stage really and everything is set up, ready to go. And, uh, you know, let's just cross fingers that it will all go smoothly and happen. The Seven Sisters TV series is going to happen. Brilliant. It's going to be so weird for you to see the characters come to life in the flesh, isn't it? That's going to well, be it, such a moment. It, it is as well. And obviously I have got some say in who plays ah. who. Um, but, you know, because I'm executive producer, um, which does sound like a very grown up thing to be. <laughs> but uh, I'm, not, I'm not actually sure it means much, but it, it does mean that, you know, I'm being very careful to make sure that I, I do have some control so now we've got some questions from directly from fans in South Africa. Uh, and of course, uh, they're all obsessed with Seven Sisters. So um, I'm gonna just fire some of these to you now. They're great questions, I've got to say. <clears throat> so the first one is from Julie Windle. And she asks, um, did you have the basis for each sister's story done before you wrote the first book? That's a very good question, Julie. And the answer to that is absolutely not. <laughs> um, I didn't. I mean, I knew, I knew the overarching story from the start. Uh, and so, in other words, all I had was a beginning and an end, which I've always known. And a lot of that is very secret as... Uh, oh, I know <laughs> as well, and so I, I'd also because the whole, and I'm sure that that most Seven Sisters readers know this, but the whole thing is, and all the sisters' characters are actually set uh, against the mythology of the Seven Sisters star cluster, um, the Pleiades star cluster. So each character, if you like, each each sister in that star cluster has a mythology all of her own mm -hmm. and what is absolutely fascinating is that when i've traveled across the world you know in search of the sister stories um the mythology in every single different culture is more or less identical for example maya is you know in all the stories she's the most beautiful uh, but she's also a recluse um, Ali is a, a very strong character. She is, you know, a sailor and uh, it's all about the sea and about, you know, inner strength. Um, 
Star and Cece were interesting because they they were there's le probably less known about those two than there are, uh, and they're actually they are a twin cluster. Um, in fact, Star is made up of two stars, uh, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so yes, yeah, so there was much more. I took what I could find about both of them, and obviously their lives. Um, and there's lots of anagrams in these books. And uh, in, in Star's story, there, there is actually an anagram for uh, her true Grecian husband, um, and he's, he's called Mouse. Um, and that is, when you get to the end, you'll find out what that's an anagram for. Um, so yeah, so I tried to take as much of basis as I could from that. So all the stories are mirroring all the mythology from around the world. Um, and then I was free range as I always am, because I don't ever write anything down. I mean, you know, I get bought notebooks to actually put things in and they just sort of pile up empty. Um, you know, I have one for each sister and it looks really impressive. Uh, and there's just nothing in them. I mean, actually, some, sometimes, you know, when you're on the phone, it's the nearest thing to you. You know, I'm writing down, you know, numbers and shopping lists and whatever. Yeah. Um, so, but I think it's really important for me as the writer to be holistic um, when I'm writing because I, so I don't know what's actually going to happen. When I start writing this afternoon, I've no idea where this particular character that I'm writing at the moment is actually going to go and what she's going to do. So it makes it very sort of exciting for me. And I go through all the emotions of, of my characters with them. And, um, you know, that means that sometimes I, I just get really irritated with them because they're you know they're i'm just like well, real what people. are you doing here <laughs> yeah, right. Not that you're making a terrible mistake um but and then sometimes you know if something really sad happens i mean yesterday i was crying buckets um all by myself i mean it's just so sad isn't it there i am talking <laughs> to myself on the dictaphone you know I'm like, oh my god <laughs> Um, because something just so moving was happening in the story and and I think maybe you know if it's if it's moving me as the author you know hopefully it's moving the reader um, yeah. and that's and that's very real yeah. so to answer your question Julie uh, I had the overarching story I had the mythology of all the sisters um, and I really went from there and then each sister's story was written in a holistic way um and i think that's that's been the beauty of it to have some you know a basic structure but then to have freedom within each story the next question is from jenna lee seward uh, and she wants to know how you choose the historical past of each sister's ancestry that's that's a really good question yeah, well i think yeah. the other, the other thing that I wanted to do, Gemma, was to, because this is basically, it's about women, for women, it's about the sisterhood. Um, so I wanted to write uh, the stories about, you know, a lot of, a lot of guys, um, guy writers, male writers, write, um, write history through war and politics. And what I wanted to write about was, you know, the history of women using sort of, if you like, cultural landmarks, which is why the book starts, uh, the, the series starts, and my story starts with um, the building of the Christ the Redeemer statue. And uh, I just happened to be in Brazil when I was thinking about this series and it was sort of coming together in my head. And um, I actually, I ended up becoming quite obsessed with Christ the Redeemer because it, it you know, it's how did it get there? It was my interest um, that actually started the process of me finally ending up meeting a few weeks later, the, the granddaughter of Heitor de Silva Costa who actually was, because I was staying in Brazil because I decided I wanted to set the past there mm -hmm. um, and find out about 
about the Cristo. And, um, you know, she was absolutely wonderful. Her name is Belle, so I called uh, the, the past character Belle. And she was able to give me just so much detail. So, and in the second book, I've always loved Grieg. I'm obsessed with Norway. Um, I, my father, years and years and years ago, who was a bit, I realized, well, very actually, parcelled esque because he disappeared off to work for the whole of my childhood and in fact has visited South Africa many times um, and he'd always come back with something and on this particular occasion I couldn't have been more than four or five he came back with this you know long playing record you know the old fashioned vinyl ones you know you called us both old fogies at the beginning yeah. So you are no longer my friend. But anyway, <laughs> so there it was. And I, I put this on and it was the Pierre Gint suite. And he said, you know, Lucinda, this is one of the most beautiful pieces of music. Norway is one of the most beautiful countries, you know. And, and so I played it and it became a sort of anthem to my childhood. And I, I really didn't, I wanted to know how an Ibsen poem, you know, had ended up with this iconic you know, um, music suite. And so, again, it was my own interest, you know, in that historical moment that took me on that journey. And when I actually, I went to the Ibsen Museum and there was this dusty library, you know, um, right at the top that I was allowed into. And, and um, the lovely director who was so helpful opened this book, pulled it off the shelves, opened the book, and just said, oh, and by the way, there was a ghost voice because the leading actress, who was very famous at that moment in, in Norway, couldn't sing and she screeched like a cat. And I thought, ah, ghost voice. And you know what? Since then, a reader came to me, and wrote, wrote me a, an email, um, and I know who that ghost voice actually originally was. Wow, amazing. I mean, just yeah. incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so Gemma, I hope that sort of, answers your question i think again it's 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 all what interests and fires me and my imagination and my sort of love of history um and it's amazing the things that i've discovered along the way so yeah and there's always an amazing um love story behind these cultural things it's incredible isn't it that uh, yeah just brilliant right i've got a question here from michelle gross um she would like to know how you synchronize the story's timeline so incredibly well with each book and within the greater series. <laughs> that's that is another very good question. It really is. That's, yeah. that's well, one I of the mean, humdingers. Yeah, I mean, con con <laughs> considering that I just said that I don't write anything down, and I seriously don't. Um, I have just... I, I keep it in my head. Um, and that obviously, when I get to the end of the story, I mean, often I'll say, oh, I think it was, you know, 1906 or 1907, um, whatever the moment is. Um, I, you know, I will then, obviously, during the edits, I will check it out and make sure that it's correct. But I don't, I, I don't know how I've done that. I mean, I know that's ridiculous, but it's, it seems to have happened. Well, I haven't finished this series yet, so let's not get too smug, Lucinda. Mm -hmm. um, but it all seems to have come together pretty well. And uh, the one thing that I always knew I wanted to do, which is probably helpful, is that I wanted to make sure that the story ran, if you like, from the beginning of 2007, which, of course, is where I had to set it um to 2008 so it was over a year in between you know parcel dying and then the girls are reuniting and getting on the titan to go and lay a wreath where ali believes she saw her father's ship for the last time and so so that part was relatively easy because i just had to stagger all the sisters going through and what's been lovely as I've got further and further along, I've been able to introduce, you know, more sisters, other sisters into the sister's story. Mm. And it's, it's wonderful. It's such a gift because it's like, they're my old friends and I know them so well. Um, and especially with this one that I'm writing, uh, there's a lot of sister action going on to, right. uh, to put it, to put it mildly. And, <laughs> and 
just been a joy to write this one so far. It's not finished yet, uh, but it really has. Fingers crossed. Brilliant. Um, okay, so the next question comes from Leonie Christodoulou, uh, and she asks, which of the seven sisters is your favorite? I knew that was going to be the question, Leonie. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you for asking me my most unfavorite question. Uh, a really good question. Uh, I, I can't say. I think I'm hoping that what happens with uh, with you and all the other readers that uh, there is one sister that, that will probably resonate, you know, really strongly. But I think there's also when I, when I'm thinking about that and which sister I most like uh, or which is my m most favourite sister, um, you know, there, there's bits of all of them in me and there's also bits that make me love all of them more and i've decided it's a bit like having children of which i have many well actually i have seven uh dot 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 um all together which was what gave me the idea in the first place mm. um and you know i love them all the same all my kids i love the same but some days i like one better than the other do you know what I mean? I do, um, exactly, yeah. So I think I love all the sisters. Sometimes I find them very frustrating, um, especially when they're doing something I'm not particularly keen on them doing, um, which was certainly the case with Electra's story, uh, because she is probably the sister that is least like me. So in a way, it's the book I'm proudest of. Um, and, um, you know, because she's, she's very sort of stroppy. <laughs> and difficult <laughs> and uh, you know at the beginning of the story she's she's self-obsessed and she's not like she isn't and then of course by the end of the book she was the sister I love most because I was so proud of her and you know her journey uh, mm. and uh, so I think it's a bit like having a new baby um, for the first few months of the baby's life. That's probably your favorite. Um, but then it grows <laughs> up and becomes like the rest. Um, so I, I really don't have a favorite sister. I'm probably a mixture of Tiggy. There's a lot of Tiggy in me. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, but also I think Ali as well, you know, is, is strong and has gone through a lot, um, you know, in her life. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for her and I, I sort of aspire to be her, really. Um, oh, yeah, that's brilliant. Good. Right. I've got a question here now from Thomas Spalpin. Uh, and he asks, and I think this is a really good question as a publisher. He says, besides <laughs> the missing sister and past Salt's books, could we get spin offs, a spin off series of the seven brothers or seven mothers? <laughs> I think that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you do. Yes. I'm going to commission them straight away. <laughs> is, is the Seven Brothers, a Hollywood musical. Yeah, it is. There is that. Brides for Seven Brothers. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Is a Hollywood musical back in the fifties. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, Thomas, I already know what I'm going to write next. Um, but obviously, uh, I can't believe that we're actually having this conversation because I can't believe that it's all, you know, in the next couple of years, you know, the Sisters series will actually be at an end and um, I'll have to go into therapy. That'll but be strange, I yeah. Think, yeah, I mean, you know, all my imaginary friends are going mm. to disappear. And uh, so I have an idea and put it this way I'm not sure um, right now we have a question here from Hasina Hayat I hope I pronounced that correctly um, and she asks will we get to see where all the sisters ended up after the end of each of their books that's interesting uh, it, it is Good. but it also ties with the question before yeah. doesn't it, it sort does. of yeah. yes uh, so Hasina um, Oh, yes, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, yes. because it really, it so irritates me when you, when you come to the, you know, as a reader, I mean, I am an avid reader. Um, and when you come to the end of, you know, for example, Harry Potter, 
and you're at the end um and you just want to you want to know what happened to them but i i think one of the problems is with um ending uh, a fictional story is that most of them end on a sort of a relatively positive note um i mean every character in it is put through the mill um but you know there i i the endings are always i hope full of hope um and and yet that moment is you know is held in aspic it's held in time and of course the next day you have no idea what's going to happen to that particular character you know um they might be sorry to be miserable and uh but but they might be run over by a bus the next day but you end <laughs> on that, that moment yeah. and so of course i always want to know where they end up and the good news is that i set this series um over 12 years ago there we go that's a there. pregnant pause <laughs> very great okay um now i have a question here from uh Kass Kasse von meyerhausen i hope i've pronounced that correctly too I uh, do you think so? <laughs> <laughs> um now she says now that you're writing the final book should we say book um seven um is there anything in books one to six that you could change something that now doesn't match anymore that is just i love i love that question it's a great question yeah i think the answer is that um no because je ne regret rien um the books were written when they were written and uh they can't sorry i've got a dog chewing its flesh at the moment and it's, it's wobbling the camera is wobbling maya stop it sorry my dog's called maya i mean how sad is that <laughs> um, um, so um but but no i think so far and i'm not at the end yet so and i don't want to feel as though i'm at the end um i don't believe there is anything that i do want to change no um there would have been things sitting here now you know writing the seventh story um that would have been easier for me writing this this particular story if certain things had been different in the past um but as i say because it's all written holistically and because i had that big overarching plan um <clears throat> you know i i don't think there is particularly no i don't um the stories are the stories and you know i'm i'm a great believer that i'm just the storyteller you know that i i just tell these stories and um and often i find out that my my fiction is actually true which is always and i walk into my own book or somebody tells me something um so i think they're the stories that were meant to be i really believe that and uh so no not so far but i'll tell you when i when i get to you know the real final 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 um part of the story yeah okay uh right now so um any mega selling author will have a lot of fans who who are um potential writers themselves and they often uh have questions uh of these writers to try and learn something and we've got a few few questions like that so um right well i tell you what jess should we share them because we'll I share think them. It's, yes i think it's really interesting you know you are big mega important publisher person yeah. um so so you are probably more equipped than me with my weird way of writing to actually answer the questions on the writing process okay. and publishing etc okay that sounds good so uh the first question is from a lady called brunilda uh and she basically says what is your advice for new writers right now i am going to pass this one over to you right um cuz i'm presuming i i mean i'll start it off and i will say very simply what i i believe and i say to anyone who is thinking about writing a book um just start okay and get to the end don't stop until you get to the end um don't go back don't cross out words don't try to make it perfect because you can always redraft it because by the end of that first draft 
you will somewhere in there have a plot, you know, a storyline and characters. So that's what I would say. The worst thing you'll ever do is stop and read what you've written because, you know, at my stage, after I don't know how many books I've written, normally my first draft that I'm writing at the moment is a pile of vomit, you know, and takes a lot of, of editing. Um, what would your advice be, Jez? Well, so I think that's very, I think that's very good advice. I've known, I've known authors who over edit. And what happens is that usually when you're in a creative state of mind and you're, you're putting something down on paper or into a dictaphone or whatever, um, there is a sort of spark to it because it's, yeah. it's the initial creative idea. Yeah. And if you then go back and over edit and over edit and over edit, which is, um, you, you draw the life out of it. Absolutely. And it becomes drier. It somehow, somehow the spark um, so it goes out of it. The other thing I would say is, um, particularly if you're a new writer, so you're trying to get, you're trying to get into, you're, you're trying to get your book published or seen by an agent or, or picked up by an agent. Um, it's really, really important that the first, I would say, e even the first 10 pages of what you deliver um, hits you smack between the eyes. Um, if you, if you take 50 pages to get going with the story, uh, by then, um, you know, readers will probably have got bored and not carry on with the book. You have to remember that a publisher or an agent is sitting there and they're willing every single um, book that they're reading to, yeah. to be the book that they, that they want to publish. Whereas a, whereas a normal reader, a bookshop reader, um, they're just, they have a choice of so many books. So if they pick something up and they're not engaged within the first few pages, they're probably going to put it down and put it away again. So, so that, that would be the one thing I would say. Um, Completely. The, yeah, those are, those are really to, my two. You've got to draw them in from page one. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So those are, those are the two things. I think those, I think we've given very good advice there. Um, absolutely. Um, and, and we, just to say we do take bribes as well we do so uh, <laughs> drink drink drink, drink. drink. <laughs> um right the next question is from uh, lydia lazovich uh and she asks uh when did you start writing and what or who was or is your inspiration another great question i i'm loving these questions south africa I mean, they're, they're fantastic really aren't they yeah um yeah i actually started my first piece of published work was a a story when i was about 10 and i won a competition uh writing competition but i was actually an actress for years i trained as a, a classical dancer as a ballerina and uh and then i had huge problems with my knee and um i went on to be an, an actress uh for years and then i got well what they diagnosed at the time was glandular fever um which turned out to be something when i was tested later on um called epstein Barr, which is a, a horrible horrible thing and i i was just in bed for months on end and i'd always you know the one thing about about me as a person is I've always had this incredibly vivid imagination and uh, I, I just you know thank the heavens for it because I can disappear into into my own head and especially during these times um, that I think that's been a real gift for me so um, I, I, I decided that I wanted to write down this story that I'd I'd been thinking of for a while. It was it was quite autobiographical because I think as a I think you normally do start um, or I'd certainly say start with something you know write about what you know. So it was about a young actress, and what I found was that it was and I was doing it longhand on sheets of paper um, because I was a broke actress at the time, so I didn't have you know all the like bells and whistles, um, and I was about. I was 22, 23 when I started writing this um, and when I was ill. And I just found it the most fantastic therapy um, because it, it actually, the process of, of being in bed, you know, and actually writing however little I did every day 
um, gave me a a sense of achievement that I was actually doing something, um, but b took me out of where I actually was at the time, which was obviously, you know, very very unwell indeed. Um, so that is how my first book came to be, and um, I had a friend who knew a friend uh, who had an uncle who'd you know was a published author, and so this this manuscript, this pages and pages, 800 pages of longhand went off. And, and this, this man who actually, I think was over 80 at the time, so wasn't my target audience, um, read it and, and very sweetly then passed it on to his agent um, who actually said, look, you know, it needs some editing. You also need to buy yourself some kind of a device to actually type this up so uh i actually sold my wedding dress isn't that um dramatic i sold my <laughs> that's like out of a novel oh, that's from a novel <laughs> it's really tacky it sounds like and actually i remember a magazine you know when they were interviewing me when the book did get published you know and it was on the front of the magazine it was like one of those big slash things that said i sold my wedding dress you know to buy my writing future or something i mean ooh. um but anyway i did and uh, so i then typed it up up sent it back to her she decided that you know she didn't have time because she was a sort of hot shot whatever um so eventually i did find an agent who worked with me on um on the book and then I ended up getting a, I mean, just, I just literally couldn't believe it, a very, very, um, as you in publishing call it, healthy offer um, from a publisher called Simon & Schuster for a three book deal, um, which was just amazing. But, you know, there was a, there was a lot of work that went into that, um, you know, and I'd got better and I had a part time job mm. at the time and, um, yeah, it was, it was tough, but I was just determined um, that I was going to finish this book. And um, yeah, I was just absolutely overwhelmed when I got the three book deal. Um, yeah. So I've got a question here from Tanya van Rensburg. Um, and she asks you, do you follow the same routine or system for each book you write? Yeah. Uh, would you like me to elaborate? <laughs> you better to elaborate, yeah. It's a quite an interesting, uh, it's a really, really unusual way of writing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Hello, Tanya. Thank you for that. Uh, I think as I, um, as I said earlier in the interview, the way that I write, in fact, actually, my my dictaphone is just over there on charge at the moment because it's a bit, it's a bit exhausted. Um, and I, 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 where really I wear my, you know, my lucky writing cardi. Um, and uh, then I, I sit on a bean bag, believe it or not, when I'm sitting. Um, if it's cold inside, I'll sit on my bean bag in front of the fire or whatever. Um, and if it's sunny, I'll go out and, and walk. Um, so the reason I use a dictaphone is because I'm actually, I really don't like computers um, and for me to actually tell a story gives me that freedom to to walk because I'm you know I realize how much I flap my hands around when I'm, I'm doing one of these things and I've watched it back and I'm like I, I'm very energetic person I can't keep still um, so I can wander around the garden I can go upstairs and downstairs and, all, and that's how I do the first draft which is what I'm doing at the moment um, and I, I work probably between well normally from around about 10 till 2 talking to myself and then I will knock off in the afternoon uh, um, between sort of 2 and, and 4 and just I don't know read a book take a walk watch some rubbish on tv just to clear my mind and actually my best writing time is definitely in the evening um yeah I mean, I, I normally start about seven and then we'll go on until whenever I sort of drop into bed. Um, and then once that first draft is finished, I get this, as we called it, the pile of vomit that has sort of grown out of nothing, which is always a fun moment. Because, and especially because I never go back uh, on what I've written. I just keep going forward. And so I can't actually end up, I, I often read it and I think, wow, what happened? You know, and I can't actually remember it me writing it uh, which makes it exciting for me because I'm it's like I'm reading a new story 
um, that somebody else wrote. Uh, and at this point, you know, I'm also looking and thinking it needs a lot of that. And so then I'll, I will begin with um, my trusty pen and I will start, it will all be printed up and I will literally edit it by hand over and over and over again until, until, and this sounds a little bit yucky, but until I can hear the sentences sing, um, there is a musicality to a sentence, I think. Mm. And once the sentences are doing that, then um, I can say, okay, Jez, book is yours. But it's only when those sentences are singing, I can send it off. And that, that, does that sound bizarre to you? It doesn't. Do you, so when, you're, when you've got the text in, are you reading it out loud again when you, or are you, are you just reading it? So you're doing, you're, you're no, having no, the no, reader's I'm experience. Doing, I've got the paper there yeah. and I'm going through every single sentence. Right. Um, obviously checking, checking all the research detail. Um, mm. But, and, and then, uh, and I can hear the sentences, you know, on that final reader, I'll go through. And if there is a sentence that isn't, I can't hear the music of it that will be re-edited etc yeah. etc uh, so yes it's I know it sounds a, a bizarre but it maybe it's my own concerto and so it's it's when a sentence doesn't sound like my voice um yeah. if you like um that that it, it's just wrong mm, yeah yeah oh, God, it's interesting um right uh got a question here just two more questions and then that'll be it I think for today um Question here from Marilyn Forey. Uh, she asks, what prompted you to write the books? Um, was it your love of reading or did you have a burning passion to write? And what inspired this series? Um, okay, well, I think I just, Madeline, hello. Um, I just explained how I started to write my, my first novel. Um, I mean, I, I have to say, Jess, that, um, and I think we, we've discussed this before, we, I mean, the whole reason that I write has got nothing to do with, you know, the sort of, as you called me, a selling author. Um, I write totally selfishly because I actually write for my own pleasure. Um, I just love writing. And I think I would actually go bananas if I didn't write because for me, it's a way of getting everything out of me, all my thoughts on the world and um, the way that I see everything. And it, it is therapy. So if I wasn't doing it, I would go mad. And even when I had a break from writing um, and uh, I was having babies and, you know, being a mum, I actually wrote three drafts of three novels during that time of, you know, all these kids, um, you know, all our 10. I mean, it was, you know, madness. Um, and... Uh, so, so that became my, if you like, my escape, the thing that I did, um, you know, just to calm me down after a day, you know, in, in toddler land. And um, so, yeah, so I think it's, it's all about having that passion for writing. And, you know, even though nobody was reading those drafts at the time, it's, I was just writing them. So... You know, and it and it's ended up, if you remember, Jess, that two of those drafts have ended up ended up becoming books. Um, well, I'll never forget you know, that. I'll never forget that thing of me saying to you, um, "Oh, you know, you don't have anything in your bottom drawer, do you?" And you said your eyes lit up, and you went, "Well, yes, actually, what do what do?" <laughs> it's like a, like a gold mine for a publisher. <laughs> uh, but, well, there's still there's still a couple there actually, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there really there's I've written I've written a murder mystery um oh, yeah. a long time ago. Um actually at that same time. So yeah. that might be interesting. But yeah. but yes, it, it's it's all about that. I mean I didn't want to give them to you if you remember no, because I, remember. I was yeah, yeah. I was I, I said, listen, leave it with me, I just need to go through them and they hadn't been properly edited and I just needed to um, but you know, one was the olive tree, and the other one was the butterfly root. Um, yeah. So I had the first drafts, and I had the basis of of both of both books. But um, no, I I basically do this as a passion. And the Seven Sisters thing, um, how that came to me was, uh, I, it was between Christmas and 
a new year and uh, I had, you know, all the kids back and I was standing outside looking up at the, the sky, actually, in an apron, seriously, just thinking about what I wanted to eat, um, you know, what I cook for supper that night for all of them uh, and what was left over in the fridge. It was really romantic. And then I was looking up at the sky and I saw the Seven Sisters because in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, they're out here between um, November and April and they were really bright. And I've always been, you know, slightly obsessed with mythology. And I was sitting, thinking about the seven kids and I was thinking about, and I was looking up at these stars and I just thought, ah, that's what I've got to write. That is what I have got to write. I'm going to write a series. And so, you know, I went inside and tried to call everybody from around the house um, and nobody came except or my beloved doggy. Um, and um, anyway, eventually everybody came down and I told them the idea. And I think like you, there were a few like blank stares. Uh -huh. uh, but no, they all said, you know, actually mom, I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, so yeah, and then obviously I decided to, um, to try and think it out and then contacted you and all the other publishers and the, hmm. Uh, and yeah, here we are, you know, seven years on, and I, I, I am dreading the end actually. As much as I'm like, right, okay, come on, you, you know, this has been your life for eight years. It's it's been very very tough, you mm -hmm. know, to actually write these enormous stories mm -hmm. in the space of what is only around about nine months, mm -hmm. you know, and it is normally nine months, you know, it's a bit like giving birth to a baby. Here we are, we're at the final question today. So um, this is from Veronica Napier, and she asks, who are your favorite authors and what are you reading at the moment? Okay, um, I'm a bit of a historical fan, um, hell surprise. Um, so I, I think, I mean, my favorite author of all time actually is F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, and he always has been, and he always will be. And I, I aspire to be him because he writes so beautifully. Mm. I, I mean, just, I mean, he, and the trouble is that, you know, I take a paragraph to, to, to write what he can, say in one sentence uh so i aspire to his wonderful thing um and his amazing you know the the the, the sort of emotion that's packed into the words he uses mm. and uh so he he is my favorite um you know i'm i've, I've actually started reading a lot of detective fiction recently okay. I, I've never read it before, but I have to say it's just just cozy crime. You know, right. I don't don't want Not any sort of visceral serial stuff. killer yeah. type stuff. I don't I don't really, especially because I read every night, and so in that moment of of before I'm hopefully going to sleep, I I and I turn the light off and read on my Kindle um, because it, otherwise it disturbs my husband. Um, and I don't really want to be, you know, reading about, you know, some weird stalker person. Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I've been, I've been doing quite a lot of, of cozy, cozy crime. Um, yeah. And, uh, there is a wonderful series, um, that I'm reading at the moment and it's by somebody called Louise Penny and oh, it's yes. called the Inspector Ganache. Ganache, yes, that's right. He's um, from Canada, isn't he? Yeah. Yes, he is. Yeah. And he is, well, he lives in Quebec and it's always yeah. snowing and it's just the most idyllic village you, you know, you could possibly imagine, you know, and a fantastic community. And it's so com comforting, actually, because at the moment, I think, you know, what I found, especially during this COVID crisis, I've wanted comfort, you know, Absolutely. and, uh, I, I think it's absolutely brilliant and I, I love the whole idea of uh, you know this cozy village that's tucked away um, but my goodness me does it suffer from some serious crime. So Lulu we've come to the end of our from all these amazing questions from your fans in South Africa. Oh, thank which... you so much for sending them in as well oh, and I absolutely. hope that some answer as many as I yeah. possibly can. 
what's good about when um, with these events is that sometimes I learn things that I didn't know. <laughs> so, um, so it's it's uh, great like that. So uh, anyway, I think we need to sign off. So um, I'm going to thank you, Lulu, for taking the time out. I know that uh, you're deep into um, the story of the missing I sister. Am. And, so I I need to go and begin writing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And so we're, I'm really, I'm really grateful, but we're all very grateful that you took the time out to talk to me today. Um, well, I'm, I'm very grateful that, you know, South Africa has just given me such incredible support. And, you know, I love reading, you know, your tweets and your emails. And, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, I really, really hope that once this crisis is over, um, I can come and visit. I'd love to. Okay, everyone. So um, uh, look after yourselves. Uh, stay safe and yeah. read, read books. The main thing is read books. That's the best thing to do in lockdown. And thanks it for everything. Is. See you soon. Bye. Oh, big kisses to South Africa and you, Jess. Bye. Uh, you too.